Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening uh, service. Um, both our pastors are in the process of traveling back from conference, so they have asked uh, Paul Greken and myself to uh, stand in for them for the service this evening. Uh, we continue our series on the back to school um, uh, series that uh, teaching moments with the master teacher. Um, we will uh, take a moment of uh, silence before we say our prayer, which is at the bottom of page one. We pray, dear Savior, although I know I am your child and that my future is in your loving and all-powerful hands, I still go through hardships in this life, especially at times for being a Christian. Help me today to learn to take joy in the crosses of hardship I carry because of my faith. Amen. Okay, we'll begin this evening with the singing of our first hymn, uh, 446, I am trusting you, Lord Jesus. Please rise. We will start our service uh, as we usually do in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As we come before you, our holy and almighty God, we can clearly see that we have fallen short of his expectation and demand for perfection. We have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To whom do we turn? You are right to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone has lived a perfect life, never once sinning against the will of God the Father. We bring our sins to him and leave them at the foot of his cross. 
You are right to trust in Christ alone for the pardoning of your sins. His willing sacrifice on the cross was a pleasing aroma to the Lord, and his blood alone has washed away the sin of the world. You are right to trust in the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. It is through the blood of Christ that your sins have been removed forever, and you have been given a new life, free from guilt and shame. Christ covers you with his robe of righteousness and purity, giving you the strength and ability to live a new life of thanksgiving and praise. Let us trust in Christ alone to guide us through his life and into the next. Trusting in Christ's free and full forgiveness and his promise that we are at peace with our holy God, let us praise the Lord. Please be seated. Our first lesson this evening is from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. God promises Abraham that all the world will be blessed through him. Today we know this is the spiritual blessing of forgiveness through Jesus. The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morai at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hill, hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west, and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson is from the New Testament book of Philippians, uh, chapter 3, verses 4 to 11. Paul demonstrates the true disciple's spirit considering everything else he has gained in this life worth nothing compared to knowing Jesus. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have done more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness of that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This also is the word of the Lord. Out of respect for the gospel, please rise. Our gospel this evening is from the the gospel of Luke, chapter 14, 25 to 33. Uh, It also forms the basis for our sermon message this evening. Jesus makes it crystal clear that becoming a Christian does not mean the easy life. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying that this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. This is the gospel of Christ. Please be seated. At this time now, we'll sing the hymn, Jesus Christ, My Pride and Glory, Christian Worship 464.
Our sermon's based on Luke 14, 25 to 33. Counting the cost and bearing the cross. Religion is no trifle, though many trifle with it. Being a Christian is no joke, though many jest about it. Following Jesus is not a trivial manner, though many make light of it. So what about you? Have you ever considered what is required of you to follow Jesus? Have you ever contemplated the difference between positive and pretend discipleship? Jesus is not a recruiter that deceivingly paints a rosy picture of what's involved to be his follower. There's no bait and switch with Jesus. Jesus is a straight up with Jesus is straight up with what is required to be his follower in a ministry that always results in two simple twofold outcome repentance or impenitence faith or unbelief life or death so to give his potential recruits a heads up he gives them a lesson called counting the cost and bearing the cross This is a gospel lesson you may not have expected. If you wish to be a disciple of Jesus, here are his requirements. They're as simple as they are horrifying. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So there you go. If you want to follow Jesus, hate your family, hate yourself, and bear your cross. Hate your family, says the Lord, not just the weird cousin that you always try to avoid at the family reunions and not just those who have somehow betrayed the family name. He doesn't say love them but hate the bad things they do. The Lord says plainly, hate your family, hate yourself, and that's hardly an effective evangelism slogan. However, it does sum up one of the costs of discipleship. The other demand Jesus makes is this, bear your cross and come after him. To those who first heard him say this, the words must have been repulsive, quite literally conjuring up thoughts of suffering the most torturous death known to man crucifixion. If you want to follow me, get your cross and prepare to be put on it. Hate your family, hate yourself, and prepare to die. This is a summary of the Lord's demands if we are to follow him. The cost of discipleship is unbearable, right? Why would the Lord make such terrible requirements if we are to follow him? because nothing less will get the job done. Without total commitment, you won't make it to heaven. Instead, you will be much like that man who builds the tower but runs out of resources partway through. A good start is good, but an incomplete building just doesn't do the job. Likewise, anyone who attempts to follow Jesus without counting the cost and making a total commitment will not be able to get the job done and everything will be lost. Perfect commitment is what it takes to get the job done. If you don't have perfect commitment, then you have less than adequate, less than adequate commitment. And then you're like the king who goes against a superior army with less than adequate troops. So let's put this in perspective. The text illustrates for us why we do not tell you that you are saved by your commitment to Jesus and by your decision to follow him or by how much you love him. We spend no time urging you to dedicate yourself further to being his disciple by your own reason and strength. Because no one can do it we might as well just urge you to sprout some wings and fly home. No one can achieve the level of commitment necessary to hate his family, hate himself, and prepare to die. 
So before we get much further, we should talk about this word hate. The word had a wider meaning in biblical times. To hate could mean to despise, as we think of it today. However, to hate could also mean to love less than someone or something else. So when Jesus declares that his disciples must hate their families and themselves, he's not calling upon them to despise their families. He's calling upon them to love him more than them. He's telling his disciples to keep the first commandment, a cost of discipleship that we can't pay. So the cost of discipleship is hate your family, hate yourself, prepare to die. It's a high cost, but Jesus has paid the price and he gives the gift of discipleship to you freely. What then does it mean to bear your cross to be a disciple? To bear your cross is to bear his cross and your burden is then as light as a feather. You bear his cross when it's traced upon your forehead with water in your baptism. For there you are buried with him by baptism into death. This is the cross that you might outwardly sketch upon yourself as you hear the invocation on Sunday morning. You will feel no greater weight or pain of Christ's cross than that. For he has suffered all the weight and all the pain. Rather than demanding your body and blood as a sacrifice for your sin, Jesus gives you his risen body and blood for the forgiveness of sin. These are the aspects of bearing your cross, to be forgiven. For in forgiveness, Jesus shares his cross with you, taking away your death and giving you his resurrection. Left to our own efforts to battle into heaven, we would be a shorthanded army facing annihilation with no ambassador worthy to go and plead for peace. Therefore, the king who commands myriads of angels comes to us. He sets the conditions of peace, the death of a righteous savior, and then meets those conditions by his own death. If a disciple knows the cost of building, if they realize the strength of the foe, and if they recognize their own poverty and weakness as a sinner, there are just two things for them to do, to despair of their own strength and to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. Therefore, we set aside all boasts of our commitment to Jesus, for our Lord exposes how inadequate it is. Amen. At this time, I'll ask you to turn to page five in the worship folder and join with me in the Apostles' Creed. Thank you. I didn't read the fine print. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'm going to put my deep hat back on and collect the offering. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like you, I'd ask you to fill in the uh, guest registers at the end of the pews. Thank you.
At this time, we will pray the prayer of the church um, on the top of page six. Lord, you have called us to be a people of prayer, taught us to call you Father, and promised to answer the prayer of your people mercifully. To this end, we come with the prayer, petitions, and supplications of your people in Jesus' name. Though your grace may seem slow, we trust, O Lord, that you will grant us all things needful in their proper time. Just as you have brought forth your own Son in the fullness of time to be our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Though we fear the world is out of control, you have placed limits upon all things. O Lord, hear us on behalf of those who exercise authority over us, who order us according to laws, who execute justice, and who defend us against our enemies. Lord, in your mercy. Though the afflictions of the body and mind confound us, you have promised to be with us in every need and to grant us grace sufficient for all needs of body and soul. Lord, in your mercy. Though time and money seem in such short supply to us, you have promised to supply us with all we need and more. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, O Lord, whatever else we need, we pray you to grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died and rose again, and even now lives and reigns with you with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, in a few moments, I'll call forward all of those that are members of uh, uh, St. Paul's congregation, as well as those in affiliation uh, with us. Um, if you are a visitor here this evening, we ask that you uh, remain in the pew and do not come forward to communion. This is definitely not a uh, judgment upon your Christian faith, but is in keeping with the way the communion has been uh, administered um, from ancient times. If you want <clears throat> more information in that regard, uh, there's a little box on page seven that describes our teaching in regards to um, in regards to communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, 
Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that whenever two or three come together in your name, there he is with them to shepherd his lock, flock so that he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now we will sing the Song of Simeon at the bottom of page 10. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. O God, the Father, source of all goodness, and in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on your favor and give you his peace. We will now sing our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, 411. Well, that concludes our service for this evening. Thank you very much for worshiping with us. I trust that uh, it was edifying. The clergy being present. Um, I don't have any particular announcements or anything, so um, just have a, have a great evening and God's blessing for the rest of your week. <laughs>